Okay, ladies and gentlemen, one more hour to go. We have a panel on wild animal welfare ethical issues. My name is Tina Kaupinen, and I come from the Finnish Center for Animal Welfare, and we have three lovely panelists here. Why and how we treat wild animals includes several ethical issues. Human action has direct consequences in, for example, hunting, game management, even poaching, but also indirect effects caused by traffic, environmental issues, forestry, agriculture, urbanization, etc. These all affect wild animal welfare, whether we like it or not. Why should we care and what could we do to take care of our wild animals? We have here today Erika von Essen from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, uh, Mikko Alhainen from the Finnish Wildlife Agency, and Kai Tikkunen from the Finnish Hunters Association. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Let's begin with your own uh, introductions. Please tell us who are you, why are you here, what do you think, and what are your main, <laughs> main interests? Please, Erika. Yeah, we were just joking about having no sense of how to start this presentation, like be really personal or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to keep it quite short and sweet. Um, I'm, I work at the Division of Environmental Communication. Uh, and, and I'm sort of one of the few people there that look at wildlife stuff, so I'm a little bit lonely. I like these gatherings for that reason. Uh, but I tend to look at nexuses or hubs in which uh, wildlife and humans connect. And hunting is obviously one such hub, uh, but there's animal tourism is another. Uh, just conservation and rewilding, those types of in engagements for sure. Um, I, I was talking the other day to... Um, to somebody called Emma Maris. She's a National Geographic writer and um, she's done like TED Talks on, on human wildlife uh, interactions and conservation. And she was telling me about this example from the US where you had some sort of wild canine um, in the south of the US. Uh, they weren't sure if it was uh, what kind of wolf or species it was, but what kind of creature it was was ultimately going to decide its fate, because it was causing a lot of problems in the area, right? And if it was a grey wolf, if they found it to be a grey wolf, then they would do nothing. They would protect this species. If it was proven to be a Mexican wolf, uh, they would have to ship it, uh, box it up and ship it to Mexico. <laughs> and if it were a, a coyote slash hybrid dog or something, they would have to put it down. And I'm just thinking that that single individual, the same organism, has such widely different fates uh, based on kind of arbitrary factors, really. And that got me thinking about contingency and the fact that context matters for wildlife. We don't actually seem to operate with a kind of universal rights for each, for all wildlife, but it seems to depend on that particular wildlife and the sort of relation that we've entered into it. Sometimes that's quite explicit. Um, for animal ethics more broadly, the animals that we've somehow bound a little bit closer to us, uh, pets, domestic animals, livestock, um, we have placed them in a relation of care uh, or responsibility and vulnerability, so we owe them certain duties that correspond to this relationship. But for wildlife, it's a lot less certain like what kind of relationship we have with them, um, and hence what, what rights and duties they should be owed. Um, and I think there's a temptation today to look at wildlife and say, let's go hands off. Um, we owe them primarily negative duties. Um, we, the best thing we can do for wildlife is to leave them alone and phase out our involvement. Uh, some of you have mentioned this as well as the hands off paradigm. Uh, the problem I think is that that's not really an accurate um, characterization of how we've related to wildlife through most of history there actually have been sort of positive um, and very in engaged uh, interactions between humans and wildlife, feeding and symbiosis and all these things. So I think the recent turn toward wanting to enact this sort of ecological apartheid almost, like wanting to live separately from wildlife, uh, wanting to rewild and leave them alone, that is a little bit anachronistic and maybe problematic. Um, so. That's, uh, that's something I've been thinking about. Um, of course, you could say that th this whole idea of um, 
of the fact that an animal has no rights in itself, no, no intrinsic rights. The only rights it has are derived from the relationship that we enter into with this animal. That's a bit problematic as well, isn't it? Um, because that would mean we only care about certain animals that we have some sort of connection to. But I think the connection and relation can be quite broad here, so we don't just have to touch and physically engage with that animal. We can have a more generalized relation to a species, for example, um, on, a, on a national level, on a cultural level. We, we connect with certain species more so than others. Um, and, and yes, I think I will kind of leave it at that. I don't want to preempt too much of the discussion questions, which were very exciting. Uh, so I'll, I'll give the, the next word. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mick Kolhainen from the Finnish Wildlife Agency. Uh, the Finnish Wildlife Agency is to start with it's uh, the Hunting Administration Party and Wildlife Management Administration Party in Finland. We work under the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry and we are more or less responsible for the sustainable use of wildlife, uh, hunter education and information and also about the derogation and hunting permits for different species of wildlife. Uh, my personal background is more in the wetland and waterport management uh, in Finland and at the international level. But I've also been involved in trap testing projects and many other issues. Sometimes it feels every time somebody, we need someone who speaks English, then Mikko is sent in. So I was invited to this uh, interesting panel as well. And uh, yeah, we look at the issue more from the legislation point of view and from the long-term benefit of the wildlife populations and of course the ethical hunting and so that the hunting is done in a way that causes the least harm for the animals. Thank you. Okay, right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kai Tikkunen. I am the communication specialist for the Finnish Hunters Association. And uh, in addition, uh, actually, uh, Heli, my, my boss, was supposed to be here, but unfortunately, she had another meeting that she had to attend to. So you got the humanist instead of a scientist here this time, but don't hold it against me. So my background is in languages, history, education, and advertising. So I've been involved in communications of many kind, but I'm also an avid hunter, so I hunt myself. I started hunting because I wanted as ecological food as one can have in Finland, because our growth season is quite short. So a mixed diet is, is very good, and local food is the best thing you can have. So that was basically how I started. But I'd like to say a few words about the Finnish Hunters Association, because it might sound confusing that we have the uh, their organization and our organization, and they are different. It, you, it started with one organization. Uh, Finnish Hunters Association was founded in 1921, so we're almost 100 years now. And it was started to promote organized and sustainable hunting. Because back then, we had just had a civil war in 1918, and we had famine, and we had lots of these problems, so people were hunting a lot to, to get food. So, so the animal population, some of them were suffering. So, so this organization was created to uh, bring more organized hunting so that we ha would have more sustainable animal populations. And from there it grew and later on it separated into two organizations. So nowadays we are more of an interest group for hunters and educational association for hunters and hunting clubs. And, and we, uh, we look at this from, from many perspectives because we have the educational aspect, but we also have the communications aspect and we have the youth work aspect and, and all of these different things. And my personal interest, as I said, is in history. And I, I have been looking at this like animal welfare in hunting with, within the historical perspective, how it has changed and if we look at hunting as it started Finland was founded basically by hunters it was settled after the ice age by hunters hunter gatherers and back then 
hunting was a profession, it was a means to survive and feed your family. So animal welfare was not really the main issue there. It was basically to get food as efficiently as possible. But later on it started developing when agriculture came to Finland and people started uh, changing it from profession to like a second job and then to a hobby later on. And, and during that time the world changed a lot and technology changed and at the same time views about hunting changed a lot as well. And, and we are now, thanks to the information age where we have social media, uh, we have a lot more contact between people of different views. So we also get to, to sort of discuss different ways of, of the different sides of the coin different uh, aspects of, of animal welfare and ethical issues. And I think that we have gone forward quite a bit because if you look at the history, uh, previously the rules that we had on hunting were religious. So basically you had a rule that you can't kill swans because they are holy. And if you do, uh, some sort of a supernatural entity will punish you. Nowadays, we have that you can't kill swans because they're protected and the government will punish you if you, if you do. So basic idea is the same, but the, the view is, is a bit different. And, and we have also started going from first from the religious view to, to logical view. And still now it is uh, more and more also about the, the feelings that how you feel about certain aspects and how you, how you look at it through there. And we have the ethics that are defined by the laws that you can't do this and this because of certain reasons. But we also have the ethics from the hunters as have been discussed earlier on that, for example, Finnish hunting clubs set different rules on top of the actual legislation. So that there might be a quota or a hunting season for certain animals, but the hunting clubs might feel that in our area we have fewer of those, so we're going to set our own limits. So there are those, and, and there are different systems like uh, they uh, protect certain uh, like uh, mating areas of, of forest birds, for instance. They don't have to, but they want to, because they think that that's the ethical choice to do. So, so there's a lot of, of these different levels here that you have the laws that define things, and then you have the hunter's ethics that define things. And also you have us trying to, to help hunters understand and give them also information on different things like we, we train them to shoot better because we want the, the hunting to be more ethical, that there are less view, uh, fewer wounded animals. So we have lots of, invested a lot in, in shooting training. And we have, we have all, all these things. And also in the age of social media, we also advise people on what kind of photos they should be taking so that they would, should show the animals in a respectful way. So, so there's a lot of new things coming right now as well, which haven't been here for more than a decade or so. But anyway, it's been very interesting to be here and thank you. Thank you all. And let's get a little bit deeper into this issue because this is also of interest to myself personally. Uh, Kai mentioned and Erika also before mentioned that uh, hunters have in addition to formal laws, they have this uh, intrinsic or normative ethics of hunting. At least in Finland, I, I think we have had this uh, Finnish ideal image of an ethical hunter. Hunting has been an appreciated form of spending leisure time, being in connection with the nature and providing the family with ethically sound food, as Kai already mentioned. And I think hunters have had these unwritten rules on how to respect game animals' life and death and how many animals, which animals to kill and when, how to take care of the environment, etc. Well, what do you think? Are there such rules anymore or have the rules changed in, in recent years or decades? Do hunters respect and comply with these rules? Because previously I've seen some examples in the internet like there have been spiked mock-ups to hurt attacking birds of prey put in in the middle of a forest there's wolf poaching in finland uh, 
some people are shooting game from inside of a car or in a road, which is not acceptable at all. Uh, what do you think, for a hunter, is it a matter of honor to respect animals nowadays? Is there such discussion going on among hunters? And how are these issues communicated to the wider public? Okay, yep. Speak, speaking on behalf of hunters, as I do, despite not being a hunter, I, um, it's hugely important to hunters because hunting didn't used to be questioned by society, so uh, they didn't really have to justify their actions or really reflect on their codes of conduct more so than just having to do so in order to preserve game for the next season. So you couldn't hunt just in any way you could because um, you needed some sort of uh, needed game to be there next year as well. Uh, but today, um, it really behooves hunters to, um, to engage in that discussion. And through my research, I th I've traced like the, the ethics discussion through hunting magazines for decades and seen how it's like increased all the time. Um, the different words and, and yeah, definitely. So it's a, it's a huge topic. But I think also that now that we're becoming more globalized and we get new sorts of hunters and we, uh, we experience more, um, we, we get more exposed to other hunting cultures as well. We tend to become more reflective about our own ethics and what is right and wrong. And I think in recent years, I've seen this um, little bit of a, um, chest pounding like all oh, the Nordic hunting ethic that is that is a pure good thing in relation to well southern European hunting ethics or whatever because that's all trophy hunting and um, we are do doing it for the meat tradition so there's been an increased differentiation also between hunting profiles and hunting communities of practice saying that you are better or worse than than other hunters that you are a true hunter for example one, one thing you have to remember here is that, for example, Finland has about 300,000 hunters. So uh, I would say that there, as I said earlier, that there are the ethical rules that people do follow them. But with 300,000, you will also have people who don't follow them. There will be some and and unfortunately you can't ever get rid of all of it but but i would say that mostly people are very interested in the ethical uh, aspects and and follow follow the ethical things and also uh, many hunters if they see somebody for example in the forest uh, shooting a game bird next to a car on the road they will call the police themselves so they do police others as well because they don't like that kind of behavior. Or hunting clubs have been reporting people who have been illegally shooting deer in the area and, and such. So, so people are interested in this. But also the, the internet is problematic because if you see a picture, because I, I deal a lot with, with social media and and there's a lot of these uh, groups where people discuss and they post pictures there. Uh, there is no way of, of actually uh, knowing whether the people who post the pictures are hunters and whether they post the picture from, from within Finland. So some, some cases, of course, the ones that police have been investigating and they have been reported, they are known. But in many cases, it's very difficult to say and some people just do it because they want to uh, troll in the group. So these, these are the problems that we have been facing lately quite a bit. But, but I, I would say that the ethical aspects are getting more and more interesting to people. As, for example, uh, as, as was said before, many people uh, start hunting because they want to find more ethical meat source. So they already have a view into it from the ethical point of view. So, and, and they, they bring a completely different set of values than some others that might have be interested in something else. Yes, as uh, American Kai well said, there is a strong ethical code of conduct among hunters that is largely unwritten. And there is big differences in traditions between the countries and also within Finland. Uh, the Finnish Wildlife Agency has made a written code of conduct for hunting and also for different types of hunting that we are promoting to hunters. 
to especially educate the younger generation to do hunting in a good and acceptable way that it's in the long term benefit of sustainable use. But of course, uh, the social media and we are having more and more different types of hunting and specific hunting groups. It's, it's a challenge and we need to work with it. But I would say, as, as well as Kai said, that we have 300,000 hunters in Finland and most of them are doing the job very well. And then we have the small minority that is making a lot of noise and some bad examples, unfortunately. We can take uh, questions from the audience if they emerge now or <coughs> later. There's one, uh, Mr. Van Alphen. I wanted to say that it, it is, um whole thing of the ethics of hunters is not only an evolution that is taking place within the community of hunters. Um, and the Netherlands is a good example there because more than half of the population lives in cities and hunting has always been a right of the upper class and so the general public is against hunting even so that in the Netherlands a law has been passed uh, that says that you cannot hunt for pleasure hunting you can only do to regulate populations or to solve problems but you're not supposed to feel any pleasure while doing it that's unethical <laughs> and <clears throat> that, that, that's what the law says so um, I, I notice indeed that it, it depends very much on where you are. I like always to compare the Netherlands with France because in France everybody can hunt. It's a privilege earned uh, during the revolution and so everybody hunts. <laughs> so it, it, I think the, 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 um, the non-hunters in the whole discussions are very important. That's Yes, obviously there are very different histories. Mikko, how do yeah, you see this? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the example of the Netherlands. If we think the Netherlands and the Nordic country, countries in European context were on the other end of the lines. In the Netherlands, hunting is almost totally illegal or in the very anti-hunting community from our point of view. Yeah. And in Nordic countries, it's part of everyday life in the countryside. It's just yeah, the, the, the way it is. Studies show and statistics show that the hunting is more accepted now than it has ever been. That is true. Acceptance of hunting in Finland is an all-time high. <coughs> but I, I think it's very important that we, we, since we are within the EU, we, we should try to learn about other cultures. Because we, I've noticed that when, when I deal with, with lots of EU um, MEPS and other people, they often look at the hunting questions from their country's point of view and they, they might be completely against some form of hunting within Finland without even knowing how it's done here because they think that it's done the same way as in their country and it might be completely different. So I think that we need a lot of uh, awareness of how things are in different countries before we can be pro or against them vocally. Oh, there are plenty of questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's take Elena first. Thank you. Um, Erika, you said that if you pay for trophy hunting, for example, uh, then your ethics may be put aside. But we also have this that you are paid for hunting. And uh, we now, in Sweden, we now have the situation with an increasing wild boar population and also discussion about African swine fever and what will happen with the spread of African swine fever with that big wild boar population. And the solution to this could be increased hunting, of course. And uh, the Swedish uh, food agency are looking into this, how to facilitate um, uh, yeah, both hunting but also handling of, of the meat afterwards. And uh, that yeah, one suggestion is also to pay hunters to uh, hunt wild boars. So what do you think will happen with the ethics? Or will it have any impact on the ethics of hunters if you are paid for it? Yes, so this is really interesting. And I just have recently a paper about this, uh, about hunters balancing between labor and leisure. So they are on the one hand sort of expected by society to clean up 
uh, tend to traffic accidents or cull nuisance high populations. But on the one hand, it's very important to them that they retain some sort of pleasure in hunting, that they're not just seen as wards of the state that are like performing a service, that are like executioners of the state. <coughs> and I think uh, there have been many suggestions for how to deal with wild boar. And if you look at Europe, how they've done, it's like everything from actually finding the people if they don't fill a quota uh, of hunting the wild boar in their area to paying bounties as they have done in the Czech Republic um, to other sorts of schemes and I think one way forward is definitely going to be this meat aspect and facilitating the sale of wild boar meat because that is seen to be the kind of big obstacle today as to why we don't hunt more wild boar um, but I, I, I think it's a difficult chapter because hunters although they like to think of themselves as useful to society performing a public service doing a labor they don't want to be seen as uh, the garbage collectors of society, like just being um, being clinical slaughterers or pest controls. It's a very delicate issue. Mikkon Kai, do you see the same phenomenon in Finland? Well, um, in Finland we, we have uh, hunters take care of uh, traffic accidents, so, and they don't get paid for it. So it's, it's voluntary work that we do uh, to help the local local police and and there it is uh, police business so it is basically it has its own laws it's not hunting it it is done you don't you don't follow the area regulations you you can you shoot the the moose in somebody's yard for instance so it, it is strictly police business and it's just hunters that are performing the, the police job and and mm. they don't consider it hunting no. and they do follow the code that's set but that's then set by the the law there so it's a, it's a bit different uh, and there I think that then it's the job of the lawmakers to make the law such that it is good for for everybody for the animal and the the protection of the all the road safety and everything but it, it's not hunting and then May I just follow up, follow up because I also think that if you are, let's say, paid a certain amount for each wild boar, then you might try to uh, hunt as many wild boars as possible, and maybe that could put your ethics aside as well. Yep. Um, Absolutely. You could modify it in a very palpable way and just becomes a, um, a commodity that you tick off, essentially. That's maybe not the way forward either. There's a question from Ida in the middle. Hi, thank you. My name is Ida. I'm from the Danish Center of Animal Welfare. Um, we see not a huge trend in Denmark, but, but though a trend within hunting that different hunting techniques are emerging. You have the bow and arrow, we have the hawk hunting, and it raises other ethical questions. Uh, what type of bow? Can you actually hit the animal? Do you? wound it more than you kill it, and what about the hawk hunting? Um, do you, what is the panel's opinion on that, about that? Well, um, bow hunting has been legal in Finland for years now, and it has been, uh, it was first for small game, and now it has been, you can shoot a wild boar and, and white-tailed deer with a bow, and it has uh, regulations on what kind of arrows you can use, what kind of arrowheads, uh, what kind of what, what strength of a bow you you have to have, and so on. And and so it has been. It took quite a long to get it legalized, and and it's been. All those questions have been raised, even by hunters in Finland. But uh, but if you look at, for example, USA. Uh, bow hunting is extremely popular there, and and bow hunting seasons are longer than for for the uh, rifle seasons. And, and white-tailed deer is the most popular uh, popularly hunted animal, and so bow is very <coughs> efficient for that. It's also quiet, and and so it doesn't really disturb the nature, or it can be used in close to closer to to buildings as well in that way because of the sound not bothering people and and the the modern bows and arrows are very very efficient 
Yeah, in Finland, the uh, hunting law and hunting decree sets the lowest thresholds for any weapon used for hunting. That were the minimum requirements. And we are trying to educate and working to educate the hunters to be responsible so they know their own personal limits and the limits of the weapon of choice so they can make the ethical and good shot. And it doesn't really make a difference whether it's a bow and arrow or a rifle. Both of them, there is the limits of that weapon and the shooting skills of the hunter that actually makes the difference whether the shot is good or bad. It's, it's basically the same as with the shotgun versus, versus rifle that you have to shorten the distance. Mm -hmm. so, so you can't be shooting with the bow from 100 meters. So it's usually 5 meters to 25 meters or so, depending on how, how people are. You have to get very close, so it requires a lot of skill. And, and so it's, it's quite difficult uh, hunting format and, and very efficient as well when done correctly. And you need a shooting test nowadays in Finland mm -hmm. for, for a large game. Yeah, there's a question in the audience, Johan Dinschön. Thank you. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, hunting uh, animals for food and hunting for animals that are competing with you. So for instance, you're hunting moose, etc., for, for food, and then you also hunt the, the fox and the bear, bear uh, etc. So, so I wonder the ethics there, do they differ? I want to ask you to elaborate on that a little bit. Well, uh, from our point of view, from the administration point of view, the ethics are the same for all game, game animals. They need to be respected the same way. That's the short answer. Yeah. Basically, like he said, I mean, uh, we look at it that it has to be sustainable. So, so if you have an abundance of foxes in the area and, and they are legal to shoot and you do it in a way that is is within the ethical framework then it's it's fine and in some cases it is it is quite necessary uh, as well uh, for population control so so i would i would agree with him here i, I would say uh that's a nice picture of it, but that's not totally the reality, I find. Uh, some, some carnivores are hunted in different ways, with different ethics to, uh, to high game, to moose, which, I mean, moose, you, uh, you have the highest possible ethical standards, and uh, fox hunting is a bit of, a, bit of an unethical chapter sometimes in, in the hunting context, just the way you talk about the fox. Uh, the very early in the season you can take out fox cubs. Um, the fact that, uh, well, you can use the excuse of, of scabies, like as soon as you see a, a fox that has remotely some, some color on its uh, hide, it's like, oh, it's scabies, so it's fine, I can take it. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, and I, but I also think that hunters are aware of that themselves, and the ones I've spoken to have been very self-critical and reflective about the fact that there are some chapters of hunting where maybe we don't uphold the same ethics as we do for all other types of hunt. I think that's life, probably, yeah. Yes, a comment from Mr. Van Alphen. Yeah. i like to comment on the, um, the necessity of fox hunting. Um, there's some good studies, um, for instance, in Belgium uh, two years ago, Foxes are territorial and they regulate their own population density. And uh, it's a myth to believe that hunters have anything to do. As, uh, there's the, only the exception, there are areas where you don't want foxes at all. And then you, you, you have to, to shoot them. But you cannot say that, um, and I think there's a real uh, ethical problem there, if the foxes regulate themselves, and hunters are taking over that role, then you have an ethical problem. Hmm. Well, if you look at the uh, status of many bird populations, especially in the Finnish wetlands, they're not doing well. 
And in many cases, one of the key reasons is high level of predation by raccoon dogs and foxes. And especially in those occasions, there is good reasons to regulate the predator numbers to conserve more rare species, whether they're huntable or not. Of course, hunters have key interest on game birds like mallard and teal that they also hunt for food and pleasure, but keeping the balance. And uh, yeah, there's been interesting discussion about rabies today, and I've heard recently that uh, a lot of the small predator populations like fox and raccoon dog have increased a lot in Europe since we started the successful vaccination process projects. So this might be that now we are kind of missing a vector in nature that regulates the pred predator numbers like fox and raccoon dog. Then what is the ethical role of, you know, keeping the balance that the ground nesting birds can survive in the wetlands? These are oh, tricky questions. <laughs> the foxes regulate our own population. And it's very well possible that for some reason or another, because you will to pre uh, protect a, a rare uh, marsh birds, or th that's all fine, you ca can hunt foxes. But indeed, if you are, have an interest in hunting uh, ducks and you mm -hmm. consider the fox to be a competitor and you shoot it for that reason, then I see an ethical problem. Let's get a bit forward. Mm -hmm. I think in Finland we mostly uh, hunt for food. Uh, we historically been mostly hunting for food. So as Kai already said that he wants to hunt to get the most ethically acceptable food as possible. That's what you said, right? Uh, most ecological food as possible. Ecological, Within yeah. Finland. Yeah, yeah. So how about Mikko and Erika, what do you think is game the most ethical choice or ecological choice for the dining table? On which basis? And what are the benefits of hunting and eating <coughs> wild animals hunted for food? instead of eating, for example, the um, common production animals. How does it compare to animal production for food, hunting for food? Um, well, I can't speak to the, the latter point, but I think this whole thing about eating game meat takes a lot of trendy boxes today, the ecological, the local, uh, the organic, and stuff like that. And also kind of the masculine, like w going back to an ideal of self-sufficiency, I take my own meat. I, uh, this kind of bear gorillas discourse of I could survive and so on. Uh, I also think that right now we are in a dietary context in which we really look toward the past to supply the ideal forms of eating. So we do this like paleo diets and everything. Like there's a quite nostalgia and romanticism about the way that cavemen and, uh, and earlier civilizations ate. So I think it, it fits very nicely within that. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave the word to you about like more <laughs> the trade-offs between agricultural production and, and uh, hunting. Well, this is quite a <coughs> multifaceted issue. Uh, like Kai said, it's very ecological in a sense that animal that has lived its own whole life in wild, doing what they do in wild, and then they're taken out by a hunter. It's in a way very, very natural. Uh, one point of view to this is also the habitat management done by hunters. I take the example of water bird habitats. In Europe, in North America, a lot of the wetland work <coughs> is based on work and funding by hunters to provide good duck populations, for example. And that's the incentive of being able to hunt water birds, to be able to eat them and utilize the resource, provides benefits for the habitat, and it's good for the whole ecosystem and biodiversity. Uh, without this action, it's highly likely that a big chunk of these areas would be used for bioenergy or agriculture. So it's actually good for nature to have hunting because it protects the habitats. Sky, would you like to compare the pros and cons of well, animal production for food versus basically hunting? Basically, if food? I look at it from my point of view first, I, I hunt like two kilometers away from my house. So we, our main source of protein is moose. We don't buy pretty much any meat from stores. And I get it from two kilometers, so no transportation by big ships or airplanes or anything. So the carbon footprint is quite small in comparison to many other things. Finland has a very short growth season here. So if you wanna eat, uh, 
fully vegetarian diet in, in winters, you have to rely on, on importing a lot of things um, or growing them in greenhouses, which take quite a bit of energy. So, so for my purpose, I think this is, this is pretty good. Also, another benefit is that I get lots of exercise because last weekend I, I ran 11 <laughs> kilometers after a moose in dense shrubbery. So, so, and sometimes we do that for a week without getting anything from there. So, so it, there's a, quite a lot of, of walking and running involved. And also, uh, game meat is usually very lean. So in comparison to like pork, it doesn't have antibiotics. It doesn't have any, any different kinds of hormones at it. Like you might be the case if you, if you buy meat from, from let's say Brazil you don't know where it comes from, so, so I would say, and I, I think that it's, it's quite good for people to know if, if they want to eat meat, where the meat actually comes from. And in here, when you're hunting, you see all the stages of it. Then you can decide whether you actually like it or accept it or not. But if it just comes in a nugget format, then, then it, it's hidden from you. So I think it's, it's quite important in that aspect. Would you say that the nature treats uh, game animals better than we do treat them in production facilities, production animals? Well, nature is not that gentle either. I mean, you have diseases, you have predators, you have everything there. But, but if you look at the industrial scale uh, production facilities, then, then I would say yes. Yeah. Of course, if you have like an organic farm, which is small scale, and, and they do their own butchery, then it might be completely different. But if you look at the large scale uh, chicken uh, production places, for instance, then, then it's completely different. All right. Let's then switch into the animal's point of view. Uh, Mikko, what do you say? What does gamekeeping, the preservation of game, game management, what does it mean to a game? animal, the individual animal in practice, how do game and environmental management and governance affect game animals' lives and welfare? Oh, quite a question to <laughs> answer shortly. Uh, yeah, uh, if I start uh, from the habitat point of view, uh, what we're trying to do in the Finnish Wildlife Agency is to promote hunters to do good habitat work, uh, to manage their forest in a wildlife friendly way that would provide good habitat for forest grouse and hares that actually would provide better welfare for those individuals having a better quality habitats. Same applies to wetland habitats and water birds and agricultural mm -hmm. landscapes and partridge for example. Uh, but there is kind of two sides of the coin here. One is what the so-called natural populations that we can increase by good habitat management and some occasions with predator control. And then it's the active gamekeeping on estates where they have very high density populations of pheasants or partridge, and they have quite often commercial hunting operations on those estates. Uh, I'm not professional on the gamekeeping point of view. I'm more in the habitat side where I work. Uh, but I would say uh, for the individual, it's probably better to be in the natural density popu dense population in the good habitats, but also in those game estates when done properly, the animal welfare is at rather good status when they have enough food and places to hide. So better to be managed than unmanaged. Yeah. Erika, how do you see this? Oh, that's a, that's a nice, like what you ended with just there. Um, th this is a debate within environmental ethics as well. I think Holmes mm -hmm. Rolston has talked about it. like. At the end of the day, the animal doesn't really care if it's managed or not managed. It doesn't have those lofty goals of autonomy and liberty, as I mentioned before. It just wants to feel, have a basic kind of welfare threshold of warm and fed and all that stuff. <coughs> but uh, we, might, we might lose other things when we, we just domesticate animals like that. We might lose other values that we, that we put value on um, around wildness and, and so on. It doesn't necessarily have to do anything with domesticating anything because if you look at like forest management, if you have uh, game friendly forestry versus cutting everything down, it's still going to be either a forest or open open field with nothing. So, 
So I would say that there the animal would care which one it's going to be. Moose is going to love <laughs> the open thing. Forest birds are going to like the other one more. So it's, it, there's a difference. Yeah, game management and forests will have lots of common interests. Yeah. Um, Kai, you mentioned the uh, hunters' associations' um, problems, maybe, of uh, some people taking uh, selfies or pictures with uh, with uh, animals, shot animals. Um, would you explain a bit more what is what is it that is problematic there, well, and why, and how do you? tackle it in your communication, for it, example? It depends on whether you're talking about selfies with alive animals or dead animals. It, because, Let's uh, take the dead, both dead both ones animals. first. Because <laughs> uh, if, if, you, if you shoot... Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, personal example. We were, uh, we were um, tracking a wounded moose that was hit by a car. So we were assisting the police. And I... We, I was using a dog on a leash to track it because it was next to a road, so couldn't use it on uh, without the leash. So we found the moose and and shot it, and I wanted to take a picture so that I could send it on WhatsApp to the hunting club that we got it, so everybody would know. And I had the dog on one hand, and dog was sitting nicely, and then I tried to take a picture, and then she lunged and bit the dead moose on the nose. So the picture that I got was <laughs> the dog hanging on the nose. Um, if I had posted that on social media, first of all, I can't do that with, with the police business. I'm not allowed to. But if it had been a regular hunt and I would have posted it there, people would have started uh, a, a flame war saying that he had the dog tear the moose to death. Without any explanation, that always happens. And people, if they don't think that they just want to show that, look, we, we track this moose, but they don't write anything there, just post a picture, it doesn't look very pretty. I, didn't use the, I used it as a bad example in, in my communication education. So I've, I've used it, shown it to people, but I explained it that what happened there. But if you just see the picture, it's going to look bad. And there are many cases where the intent is good, but the presentation is not very good. And then the, the idea that you get could be completely different. Or another one is that uh, capercaillie hunting starts earlier in Sweden than it starts in Finland. And many Finns go to hunt capercaillie in Sweden. So some people post a nice picture of a capercaillie in a hunting group in Finland without any kind of explanation. Then people start calling the police that this has been shot illegally in Finland. And then they had to explain that, no, this was shot in Sweden legally. So these are the things that people should uh, mind when they are posting pictures that it should be in good, good taste. It should be, and you should explain what happened there and why and, and how. And you should not be posting pictures that are very, very poor, like my example first, because th there's no point in having such a picture other than as a bad example <coughs> in, in training. Yeah. So that the good, good intention but the wrong context yes. leads you to problems. Erika, you have actually studied this. Yes, uh, yes, I have. Um, and you, one and I recently had a animal symposium, animal tourism symposium, uh, where we discussed animal selfies from a different point of view, not just the trophy hunting shots, but uh, when this phenomena of uh, people going on holiday and wanting to have some sort of photographic representation of the wildlife interactions that they've had, whether that's been at a zoo or if it's been um, uh, some sort of wildlife sanctuary where they're curling up with tiger cubs and, and bottle feeding them. It's like it's a whole industry now taking pictures with animals and um, with wild animals in particular. And I think that's a really fascinating phenomenon that's problematic on many levels and but just it seems like socially we 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 want this sort of close connection to wildlife we want this sort of embodied um cuddly cuddly image with wildlife uh because we are so alienated from wildlife in everyday life in our <coughs> in our sort of urban based everyday life um 
So it has like personal and more societal drivers of, of alienation as well. Uh, it's become a huge social thing on social media and Instagram to post selfies with animals, sloth self selfies or whatever they are, uh, which are problematic because if you can take a picture with a wild animal, there's probably something that's not totally right there. There's been some element of maybe drugging or feeding or coaxing and manipulating. Um, so it's kind of difficult, but it, as a social media influencer, it can look very nice and it can show that you're kind of well-rounded, well-traveled cosmopolitan person who's in touch with all the, the latest trends in society. I think it's a really harmful way. Of, yeah. Yes. Mikko, have you got personal experience of this trophy hunting and do you see this phenomenon in the trophy hunting field? Yeah, well, uh, it's quite important, I would say, in trophy hunting to take pictures with your trophy animals and share with your friends. Um, also, many of the trophy animals are mounted as the hunting trophies to have at the hunter's home. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's also a multifaceted issue. In, in principle, I don't think there is nothing in principle wrong to have a nice memory of a hunting event. And if you like to hunt for the trophies and the meat is utilized well and everything is done based on the rules and social and ethical code of conduct, it's fine. But of course, in the times of social media, it doesn't always go, go well and some people post bad pictures and there is also this part of the hunters that don't follow the ethical code of conduct and I doing do, bad for representing. Um, they have positive, uh, they have advantages too. It's research mm -hmm. seems to show that uh, while well, photography, the photos become the new kind of trophy. So mm -hmm. for a lot of hunters, it's not really about shooting the animal anymore. It's shooting it with a camera. Uh, so they it can post this uh, these pictures on a hunting forum or, or you know, uh, in their social network, and it's like become a really important way of sharing wildlife experiences that aren't like consumptive in the sense of taking lives. So it could replace some some harvesting long term. Yeah, at least <coughs> you have to very carefully consider what is the effects of of putting, uh, taking selfies with animals and putting them into Facebook, for example. What is the effect on the welfare of other animals of the same species, for example, or the same population? Uh, there are two questions, three questions in the audience. Let's take first Sanna. Yeah, about posing with the animals. Uh, I'm working in the zoo and when I'm talking about wildlife or wild animals, I'm not talking about zoo animals, I'm talking about like wildlife. And we have a wildlife rehabilitation center in the, in the zoo and we have to think about these things all the time because we don't want to post pictures where people are posing with the animals. It's a totally different thing to take working pictures when someone is treating an animal and then someone else takes a picture. But we kind of think that if it looks too cute on the Facebook, you are probably doing something really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so because um, there is a lot of examples in the world that actually people have posed with the animals and that way killed like, for example, whales. People go, they find a dolphin baby on the beach and then they start to pose with that and the animal dies because yeah. of that. And we have had here in Helsinki too, like seal cubs on the beaches and people go there with the dogs and cameras and pose with the animals and that's, that's a really bad thing. And that's maybe needs a little bit of education in that point. Mm. I think that uh, you can, if, if you talk about live animal uh, photos, I, I think you can uh, differentiate between between nature photography and, and the selfie phenomenon. Because nature photography, you usually have a, like a long lens and you take it from afar without disturbing the animal. And, and you can even do that with selfies. I mean, if you're in a bird watching tower and a deer happens to walk underneath and you sort of take a selfie with that deer that doesn't even know that you're there, uh, then I think that's completely fine. Or if you're like sitting in your yard and a small bird comes to greet you and then you take a photo while the curious bird came there, then it's fine as well. But if you go and start 
uh, taking like uh, small fox puppies out of the, the cave and posing with them, then we enter the, the completely wrong selfie culture or that you, you want to dive in, in like a crocodile filled river to take an action photo, then it probably might not hurt the crocodiles, but it will certainly hurt you. So, so there are, are these different problems. Then you end, end up being su problems. surprised, how, how come they hurt me? Uh, question in the back, man in a blue shirt. I would like to know from the panelists, uh, what do you think about artificial feeding of these wild animals like bears and <coughs> wolves and wolverines? Artificial feeding? Yeah. We talked about this during the break actually. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting and I heard it's a big industry in Finland for, for, uh, for tourism. Magan has talked to me about this as well and I think it's really fascinating how they like lured large carnivores, including wolves and wolverines and bears, to the same sort of baiting site just to get photog photographs and hunting opportunities for that. And I'm just like, oh, what are the long-term repercussions of that sort of phenomenon? Um, what happens when the food runs out? Uh, it's probably cute to see all those animals interacting first there, but, uh, but it's very problematic. And I, I think I raised that briefly in my presentation as well. The effects of feeding are uh, they, they raise all sorts of questions about do implicitly domesticating animals and conditioning them to certain ways and cheating hunting in a way if you don't if you bait animals to come to a certain area. Yeah, it's uh, quite a hot topic at the moment in Finland uh, <coughs> in terms of large carnivores and the nature photography, but also in terms of water bird hunting over bait. Uh, there's a lot of discussion whether that's ethical or not among hunters. And then with the high population density of white-tailed deer, for example, in southwestern Finland, what is the role of feeding in that uh, case, mm. given having the high populations up. Actually, we're going to have a seminar days next week in the Wildlife Administration and the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry discussing and thinking how to handle these feeding issues in future. Good. Very acute issue. It's, I think it's a two-sided coin because if you, if, for example, feeding white-tailed deer, you can also reduce um, road accidents if you, if you put the feeding places so that they don't have to, let's say, cross a, a very highly trafficked road to go to some sort of field. So it, it can be used to help certain areas. And, and also, if you hunt white-tailed deer, from a feeding place, you can ensure, because the animal is going to be standing, you're going to ensure a very ethical shot in the completely right place when it's not moving about there. So there are benefits from, from mm -hmm. feeding as well. Yeah, absolutely. There is many benefits on the feeding to organize hunting well and safely. But then there is the other side of the coin that are, is the feeding in the bigger picture yeah. done right that it's good for the population and good for the overall goal. There are so it's good and bad sides. Yeah, it's about uh, defining the One balance. more question in the front, Martins. Thank you. Uh, sm small comment regarding uh, trophy photos. So that I think that uh, this is not the, just a problem, let's say the problem of the hunters, because uh, that uh, we uh, for example, in Latvia, it's very common that in, during the autumn we go to the forest and pick up the berries, pick up the mushrooms, and then if the, our harvest was extremely good and nice, and a lot of people make photos and put in the Facebook, in, in Instagram, so that in that perspective, I'm, I think that it's not the right way that blame or uh, make some diagnosis only in hunters. Mm -hmm. I think that all we here got had some kind of diagnosis. Uh, and <laughs> I think for uh, psychologists, uh, uh, it's quite easy to, to say for me, for Kai, for whatever, for all of us. So that uh, I think this is not a problem of, of, of real, only in, on the hunters. Uh, I think this is uh, mainly that uh, uh, during the last 10 years when the social media become very active and, and uh, I think this is just an educational question. Uh, the hunters are under the under the microscope, mm -hmm. especially during the last years, and, and everybody wants to uh, blame somebody that something happened wrong in our climate and something like that. And 
one of the guilty guys are, are the hunters. So that I think in, in that perspective, uh, it's maybe even worse to make the picture with the, some echo banana that you eat <laughs> uh, and say that you are a really good guy, that you eat very ecological food, but it's traveled several thousands of kilometers. So that it's a discussable question for me. So every one of us who has taken some nice pictures of mushrooms on a frying pan this autumn and put them on the Instagram <laughs> account, shame on you. <laughs> I, I Are there basically think that it's, uh, I mean, we, the way we do communications has changed. Because we, we used to be, first of all, it was face-to-face -face communications, that was telephone communication, then we got into email communication, then it was chatting on social media, and now it's uh, visual. We want to share pictures, and it's basically because of Instagram and others. So it, it's just the way of commu communicating nowadays. People want to do it, whether they post a picture of their morning lunch, uh, I mean, morning breakfast, or whether, whether it's them in the gym or, or doing whatever. Basically, people want to show that they live an active and interesting life. Mm -hmm. And then it just depends on what their angle is. So I, I think it's just basically everybody who is on social media does it. And it's uh, in a simple way to say it's just showing the others that I had a great day outdoors. This is my harvest of food, whether it's fish or mushrooms or a game. Uh, do we have questions from the video stream audience? So there is a question about welfare problems implicated in falconry hunting, so hunting with, hunting with birds of prey, but well, it's I guess specific, okay. at <laughs> least in Finland it doesn't happen. Do you want to take that one? Or? Well, you can start with the legislation <laughs> point. Uh, <laughs> that's always, yeah. Well, that's a tricky question. I'm yes. not an uh, <laughs> expert on falconry. Uh, if I recall right, it's kind of in, I would say, kind of gray area probably in Finland. It's not strictly forbidden, but there is not really a regulation on it. It's so not, I don't... It's not forbidden, but yeah. uh, you are not allowed to breed the birds, capture the yeah. birds, or import the birds. So basically right. you <laughs> can do it, but technically, if magically you were handled the bird, you could use it for yeah. hunting. But I think there is one that does it in yeah. Finland. Because they got it through some sort of a loophole that, yeah. that is closed now. So it, it's not really our specialty because it hasn't been allowed here since ages ago. Yeah. I, I don't have much to say, but I think that this falcon hunting and bow hunting, they're quite interesting to me in terms of uh, um, being kind of throwback techniques to hunting, maybe reacting against some of the very strong technology that we have now, where you can basically just... Uh, use a remote surveillance camera, sending a text to your smartphone, now the animal is here, and uh, maybe even virtual hunting, you can set up a, a hunting link through, <coughs> through, on <coughs> <coughs> through online, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so it's become like, oh, we want to go back to basics and, and the natural way of doing things. We want to use a bow and arrow, or we want to use like an actual animal the way that mm. they did. Yes. I'm, I'm going to ask <coughs> the last one question. Actually, is, is this what you were explaining? Just Is this uh, some sort of... Um, you, you have been talking about this embodied turn of experiencing wildlife. Would falcon hunting be something like that? Or what, what does this embodied turn of experiencing wildlife mean? Why and how it has emerged? And why is it so strong and apparent phenomenon nowadays? What do you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. Like we, the more alienated we become from nature, the more we seem to want to re-engage with nature and reconcile with nature. And, and there are so many contexts in which that's played out. Hunting is one. The increased popularity of hunting, uh, but also animal tourism, all the wildlife interactions that that are now a huge industry for sale. And uh, you know, I think it it comes back even to the Romantic era of like the 1800s we wanted to re-engage with nature somehow, but then we were content to just gaze upon nature, see it as a pretty postcard. But now we want to like really um, have an embodied turn, and that's what I mean by that. We want to we wanna swim with sharks, and we want to uh, go cage diving with dolphins, or the other way around. Um, 
and and uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, um, and just these these ways of really re rediscovering our connection with animals and yeah, I'm not sure like where it will go 10, 20, 30 years from now if we will want a different relationship with wildlife because if one thing history has shown us is that we tend to change our minds a lot about what kind of nature relation we want to have. We either want to push civilization uh, out, we want to push wilderness out of civilization and, uh, and now we kind of want to go back to it. So there's no predicting which sort of turn we'll take in, in, a, in a couple of decades, I think. Uh, Mikko, does this sound familiar to you? Yeah, <coughs> to some extent. The world is changing all the time and the way how people see these issues is, is changing. And if I think about the hunters, there's going to be a more diverse hunting groups. Some hunters specify into certain type of hunting and others go to maybe falconry or bow hunting with, to get that experience. Other ones go with the high tech to do very efficient hunting. So The high tech thing though, I mean, I'm not saying that technology creates a, an increased distance between humans and animals. It can do. You don't have to engage with them as physically. But I think this like nature, nature photography and nature documentary trend with BBC Earth and all that has used technology to get extremely close to wildlife uh, so that we can have like almost intimate, personalized relationship with with wildlife that we just see on television or that we follow through video surveillance feeds like in a, in a, in a falcon den or something. So technology can actually bring us closer to wildlife as well, in addition to bringing us further from it. And the benefits of technology, if we think about culling of a problem population, example raccoon dogs out of a bird area, uh, it provides tools to do very specific culling of individuals yeah. But then we need to have less action in the field, you know. Without game cameras, the hunter should need to take their dogs out for extended period of time to search mm -hmm. for raccoon dog. With the game camera, you have a bait, raccoon dog comes, you get a picture, you can just take the animal out with least disturbance to the rest of the wildlife. And uh, I, I've usually been the very much of a low tech person in, in my family. My wife sort of hates me for it because she's an extreme high tech person well, no, that, in the IT industry. But, um, but anyway, uh, high tech has been very good for one thing, which is dog safety. Mm -hmm. And dog GPS is, is a brilliant invention. You, you, can, you can find your dog and, and try to prevent if, if the dog is trying to go on, on like a, across a river, which is very rapidly flowing or, or on, a, on a road somewhere <laughs> so you can get and try to intervene it. And so, so in dog safety, that has been very, very good. And that is one of the things that I, I would never go without. But I'd like to comment on the previous one, which is that I think that I look at it from the communications point of view, that I think that uh, when I was growing up, we, we had magazines and you had to find the information on magazines or books but nowadays we have online everything you have youtube channels everything so so you can find out about different hobbies and different types of hunting and different uh, possibilities abroad a lot easier nowadays and i think that people have been interested in trying different things but previously they didn't have the the availability that we have nowadays and you also have the the possibilities of previously you had to contact somebody by phone or send a letter nowadays you can you can contact them on online on social media or somewhere or you can use like a Finnish outfitter if you don't speak the language so you can go go abroad even just knowing Finnish so it's it helps and it has given a lot of diversity so I think that is partially also a communications issue. Yes, we can make the choice. But now I think we need to end for today. We have a long day behind us. We have heard lots of interesting talks today and discussed topics from the welfare of invasive animal species to animal welfare in hunting. And last but not least, this panel discussion with our experts Erika, Mikko and Kai. Thank you all for this discussion. Thank and we you. can go on with this tomorrow. We'll meet again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in this same place. 
and continue with the welfare of semi-domesticated captive animals, which means reindeer. So welcome tomorrow and now have a nice evening.